This is Woodman here with another channel's message. Samsara, the cycle of repeated birth, mundane existence, and dying, is considered suffering in both Buddhism and Hinduism due to the inherent dissatisfaction and pain that pervade all forms of life. This suffering, known as dukkha, arises from our attachment to desires and the ignorance of our true nature, which leads to an endless pursuit of transient pleasures. Life in Samsara is characterized by impermanence, meaning that all joys and experiences are fleeting. This continual cycle results in emotional and physical suffering as individuals grapple with loss, dissatisfaction, and the inevitability of death. As such, existence within samsara is often seen as unsatisfactory because even the most pleasurable experiences are ultimately accompanied sooner or later by suffering. In samsara, rebirth occurs in six realms of existence, which are characterized into three good realms and three evil realms. The three good realms are the heavenly realm, the demigod realm, and the human realm. The heavenly realm is characterized by extreme pleasure and bliss, where beings enjoy long lifespans and happiness, often perceived as the highest state in samsara. However, this realm is still subject to impermanence. The blissful state eventually fades, leading to rebirth in lower realms, because once good karma is exhausted, you then move to a different level. The demigod realm, while also filled with pleasure and power, is marked by jealousy and conflict with gods, causing suffering despite its higher status. Finally, the human realm is unique as it provides the opportunity for enlightenment. Humans experience both suffering and joy, making this realm particularly conducive for spiritual development and the pursuit of nirvana. Conversely, we have the three evil realms, animal, ghost, and hellish realms, and these are characterized by extreme suffering and a lack of awareness. The animal realm involves ignorance and a struggle for survival, where beings face constant danger and suffering without the capacity for higher understanding or enlightenment. The ghost realm, or the preta realm, is marked by insatiable desires and a perpetual state of hunger or thirst, symbolizing the anguish of being unfulfilled and longing for more. The hellish realm represents the most severe suffering, filled with intense pain and torment, often as a result of one's negative karma. Existence in these realms is a direct consequence of past actions, reinforcing the belief that one's karma determines the quality of future rebirths. Karma as the law of moral causation plays a crucial role in the cycle of samsara. Actions driven by desire, ignorance, or unwholesome intentions can create negative karma resulting in suffering in future lives. Conversely, actions based on compassion, wisdom, and ethical conduct can generate positive karma leading to more favorable rebirths in the good realms. Thus, one's experiences in the various realms are deeply influenced by the cumulative effects of their past deeds. This understanding fosters a sense of responsibility and an urgency to act wisely in the present as every choice shapes future experiences. The desire to rise to the higher realm and avoid further reincarnation stems from the understanding of the unsatisfactory nature of samsara itself. Even in the good realms, beings ultimately face the inevitability of decline, rebirth, and then suffering. The ultimate goal is to attain nirvana, the state of liberation from the cycle of samsara altogether. Nirvana represents the blowing out of desires and a realization of true insight into the nature of reality, that impermanence and non-self are givens. This liberation allows individuals to break free from the cycle of suffering, transcending the limitations of existence in the realms of samsara. As such, the pursuit of enlightenment is seen as the highest aspiration, enabling beings to escape the repetitive cycle of birth, existence, and death. If you think of our existence as like a matrix, then it's like getting unplugged from the matrix. Nirvana is often described as freedom in both Buddhism and Hinduism because it represents liberation from the cycle of samsara, the breaking free of the matrix, the getting away from that ongoing cycle of birth, death, and rebirth, which is characterized by suffering and dissatisfaction. By achieving nirvana, an individual transcends the limitations and constraints of worldly existence, which are perpetuated by desires, attachments, and ignorance. This state of liberation allows one to experience a profound state of peace and ultimate release from the burdens of life. One key aspect of nirvana is a cessation of craving and attachment. In samsara, beings are caught in relentless pursuit of desires, whether for pleasure, material possessions, or even emotional bonds. These cravings lead to suffering as they are inherently impermanent and often unattainable. Nirvana signifies the end of this cycle of desire, providing for a state where one is no longer driven by the constant need to grasp at fleeting pleasures. 
The freedom from craving leads to a deep sense of contentment and inner tranquility. Furthermore, nirvana is also freedom from ignorance, which is seen as the root cause of suffering. Ignorance in this context refers to the misunderstanding of reality itself, particularly the nature of self and the impermanence of all things. When individuals achieve nirvana, they gain true insight into the nature of existence, realizing the interconnectedness of all life and the illusory nature of the self. This understanding dismantles the ego, and it dismantles false identities that bind individuals to suffering, granting them liberation from the cycle of rebirth. Consider it as if you were going back to the source and you were choosing to be one with everything. In addition, nirvana represents a freedom from the karmic consequences of actions. In the cycle of samsara, every action generates karma, which influences future experiences and rebirths, often trapping individuals in cycles of negative karma. Attaining nirvana means breaking free from these karmic chains, as one no longer generates new karma through unwholesome actions or desires. This liberation allows individuals to exist beyond the limitations of cause and effect, experiencing a state of being that is untouched by the burdens of past actions. Moreover, nirvana can be seen as a state of ultimate potential and realization. It is not merely an escape from suffering, it is also the attainment of a higher state of consciousness and understanding. In this sense, nirvana embodies the freedom to fully realize one's true nature and potential, which is limitless, unbounded, and timeless. The state of enlightenment brings with it a profound sense of joy and equanimity, liberating individuals from the turmoil of worldly concerns. Lastly, the freedom of nirvana extends to the relational aspect of existence. In samsara, relationships can often be sources of attachment, conflict, and suffering. Nirvana provides freedom from these entanglements, allowing individuals to engage with the world from a place of compassion and wisdom, rather than attachment and expectation. Sometimes this might be referred to in spirituality as becoming an ascended master. This shift transforms one's interactions, fostering a deep sense of connection without the constraints of desire or clinging. In summary, nirvana is freedom because it signifies liberation from the cycle of suffering, ignorance, and desire. It is a state of profound peace, insight, and contentment, allowing individuals to transcend the limitations of samsara and realize their true nature. This freedom transforms not only the individual's experience of existence, but also their interactions with the world, promoting a sense of compassion, as well as interconnectedness that is free from the burdens of attachment. I would think that when I was in college, and I want to say probably around the time I graduated college, I had a notebook that I used to simply write poems in. And I noticed that a lot of the poems I tended to write tended to focus on the oneness of life. In other words, I'd write things in the poems like, I am you and you are me and we are one and can't you see? And at the time, you know, I just thought, well, that's just a feeling that I had. And I wanted to put that down on pen and paper. And, you know, it was interesting. But uh, many people who read it said it just sounded kind of silly. It sounded like non- nonsense. It sounded like hogwash, right? Like, like, we're all different people. We all have different wants and needs. You know, why am I becoming the philosopher? Why am I so delving deeply into these esoteric formulations of how the universe really exists? But, in a sense, I was probably onto more than I realized back then. That... At that point, I was starting to detect the nature of the matrix that we live in each and every day. And that realizing the nature of the matrix, I realized that, yes, it's all well and good that we are allowed to incarnate into these forms and learn powerful lessons. But that it, in the end of it all, that's what we're really here for. A lot of people may exist and just think, you know, the point of life is live the life you want, try to get as much as you can before you die, and then you go away. But because of samsara, because we're constantly coming back, you know, we're constantly coming back and learning new lessons. It might be in one lifetime, we need to learn about how to stand up for ourselves. Maybe in another lifetime, we need to learn how to choose our friends wisely. Maybe in another lifetime, we may learn how it is to be a selfless person, maybe serving as a, as a priest or a nun, you know, for a particular church and that we are giving and that we don't have a sense of selfishness because we are fully immersed in this universal principle that we should take care of our brothers and sisters. You know, each of these lives may come with different lessons and, and may come in lessons in relationships. It may come with lessons in 
and being on a team and how to how to work together as a team or maybe the nature of power and, and becoming a high-ranking official a politician and what it takes to maintain that power and to be able to satisfy the people that you are ruling over that your rule is just so these are all different iterations of things that can happen and they're, they're great lessons and all but that's what they ultimately are they're lessons and through those lessons there are going to be a lot of cycles of suffering a lot of cycles of painful experiences a lot of cycles of betrayal and so at the end of it all you realize that yes this is all great this keeps us occupied for a time but that's all it is it's just a time that we spend away from being oneness within the source and that ultimately you'll find that people that talk about near-death experiences often talk about how they return to the source and how once they're back with the source it becomes a state of bliss that they cannot even describe that they just know that they're one with everyone and that there's this feeling of love and that when in fact the doctors or first responders find a way to resuscitate the person bring them back that you know that maybe yes for i don't know a minute a person might register as dead but then all of a sudden they start breathing again and they come back that they feel as if they're ripped away from something that was so beautiful that was so warm that they're like no 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 send me back send me back and and they're not sent back because they're brought back into the world to finish out their lives and so the very real sense you get is is that you know we're allowed to have these experiences and it's all well and good you know it's like a play on a stage and we get to play certain roles and play certain characters and experience certain things but that ultimately we will return to the one we will turn to the source the 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 unity of us all and that we will again find that state of nirvana once more and then we no longer have the need to desire things and to keep going back to earth and facing karma again if you like this message please like share and subscribe if you're new here welcome aboard it's a safe space all are welcome if you're returning thank you so much i love you so much you make this channel great i wish you uh, health wealth prosperity and abundance in the name of the most high god i wish you blessings and protection if you so deserve it Woodman signing off have a great day